Well, we now know that COVID-19 is a communicable respiratory disease, but do we know what impact the disease has on the system as a whole? Does it affect the immune system, including autoimmunity? Professor Adrian Purin from National Institute for Communicable Diseases unpacks this with us uh, this morning. Uh, as usual, Adrian, good morning. And uh, I suppose let's get straight to it. You know, we're seeing all these articles about uh, COVID-19, things like headlines like uh, the virus producing sinister tentacles and infected cells, and that creates pictures of some alien-like invasion of the body. So let's just calm the panic, set the record straight, and talk scientifically about what COVID-19 is actually, what it actually does, what effect it has on the body. Yeah, so um, like any other virus, I think we are always interested to know how this virus interacts with cells. And this is really routine in terms of, for example, diagnostic approaches, in terms of what the virus actually does to cells. And some Very often, viruses produce what we call pathognomonic changes in cells. So when you look under a microscope, whether that be a light microscope or an electron microscope, you can see these particular changes once the virus is bound to a specific receptor or receptors, what those changes could be. And so, for example, viruses like polio and other viruses can bind to cells, and these can, uh, or measles in particular, can result in cells actually merging together. And so you form what are called syncytia, for example, or it can actually kill the cells. And you can see how these cells become necrotic or apoptotic, depending on the nature of that particular interaction. So these tentacles mm -hmm. may well just be part of what we would expect a virus to um, have on a particular cell in terms of these particular tentacles. So I don't think one can see anything evil or sinister in that. It's, it's really what one actually observes. And these are very often important observations as to how a virus interacts with a cell. And as I said, some of these changes can become pathognomonic or diagnostic for us to say, well, this is a, a viral change on these particular mm. cells. So I suppose, let's get a little more scientific then, Prof. And, and, and you know, once a person has recovered from COVID-19, do those cells remain changed forever, ineffective? Do they go back to normal? I mean, it's a very layman question, but in my mind, I'm just trying to build a picture. Yeah, so that's a very important question. In fact, there has been a recent publication to show that, in fact, um, and again, we need to just be cautious. It's, it's one paper, a small number of, of participants or patients that have been enrolled. In fact, the, what they've observed was, in fact, that there's a destruction of, of T cells. So the number of T cells that they observed actually were markedly reduced. And I, I think it's in a group of patients that had a more severe a disease outcome. So that gave them the picture similar to, to HIV. As you know, with HIV, um, it actually targets specific cells, in particular the CD4 cells, and we see a, a marked decline in CD4 cells in the presence of HIV. And these particular authors were arguing that what they were observing, the reduction in, in T cells, was very similar um, to what was observed in HIV. And again, if you're thinking about how to manage this disease, um, then again, it gives you some thought about how to intervene, for example, the combination of antiretroviral drugs uh, which is cert certainly being formed part of some of the trials to see whether or not um, that can actually uh, uh, affect the, the, the cell transmission or life cycle of the virus. Well, Prof Singh, as a specific target is the immune system, as you've, uh, you said earlier. Now, autoimmune also seems to be a big concern. Sufferers of autoimmune, I'm one of them. I live with Hashimoto's disease, and it is something that you have to manage very carefully. Are there any particular uh, sort of, uh, is the impact a little more magnified when it comes to COVID-19, especially for autoimmune sufferers? Yeah, so I think at this particular stage, um, there's not much evidence to show because I think it's the, the, it's a numbers game, in other words. Um, and we've seen the, the effect of, of uh, this virus in terms of severe outcomes has been on people that have particular comorbidities like diabetes or, or hypertension. Mm -hmm. But there's no good evidence at this stage that, for example, in, in Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, which is, affects the thyroid, that in fact there is a worse outcome. But I, think, I suspect that that may well be uh, because the, the, the numbers are, are so small for us to really have specific guidelines around that. I think it's around the management of your, your particular mm. condition that becomes uh, really critical. But con con contrast to that, in fact, as you've seen, um, is the effect of this virus in terms of causing an immune-like picture called Hashimoto's, for example. Oh, sorry, Ka Kawasaki, sorry. Mm. Um, and indeed, it, it, Kawasaki's is, again, an immune condition, we think, caused by viruses and possibly other bacteria. And a similar picture seems to have uh, been found in children. And we've seen that in, I think it was in Italy and Spain and the UK and the United States, where 
children appear to have this particular condition very similar to Kawasaki syndrome, mm. and it appears that this virus has, has been implicated in that in those particular conditions. Again, I want to stress that this is rare in comparison to the total number of, of, of cases that we, we have come across. All right, and very, very quickly for us, Prof, I mean, how do we then control the viral rep replication when it comes to COVID-19? Yeah, so I think this is um, what I've just described is the, the effect of this virus is on, on multiple cells, and particularly on the immune cells. So again, are there opportunities for us, for example, um, to target, for example, the, the receptors that are that bind to particular cells? So again, the focus is on the so-called spike pr uh, protein of the virus. Or again, like HIV, are there specific drugs that we can use in combination, like the antiretroviral drugs? And there are these trials like remdesivir, for example, and lipinavir, um, to actually try and see whether we can actually control the, the life cycle of this particular virus. Okay, it gets more fascinating by the day. Thanks very much, the NICD's Prof. Adrian Purin there.